I'm Len Sassaman. I'm going to be talking about certificate authorities and uh, their use with SSL. Following me is Dario Diaz, talking about the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. And after Dario is um, substitution, Stephen Sue. And I have his talk right here. It's IP spoofing and strong encryption in a service free internet. Okay, so today I'd like to discuss a bit of technology that most of you are probably familiar with, um, which you've at least encountered doing financial transactions on the internet, browsing secure websites. That's um, SSL. And if you've ever used SSL, you've relied on a certificate authority for part of the security afforded to you in the uh, transaction. Now, one of the questions I'm going to focus on is what is a certificate authority, especially in relation to web browsing and SSL? And exactly what does a certificate authority do for you? Why do you need one? The purpose of a CA is to verify a set of facts about an individual or an organization. And then it presents them to the people that need them in a way that cannot be spoofed or faked. This is traditionally done through the use of X509 certificates. The CA goes through its verification process, which I'll talk about a bit um, in a few moments, and takes this information once it's been verified, embeds it in a file that is then signed with the certificate authority's digital key, and then that's distributed out to the people that are going to be using it. This is this digital certificate, the uh, signed file and collection of information, is verifiable offline. You don't need to contact the CA whenever you want to verify it. Um, you will typically encounter SSL certificates when browsing websites. Uh, website certificates generally contain a URL, a company name, contact information, copy of the, and most importantly, the copy of the uh, web server's public key. That's, that particular piece is really all that's necessary. Um, the rest is pretty much irrelevant because the, um, the CA is really not providing you with anything except the verification and they do a pretty lousy job at that. So um, most important aspect of SSL is the encryption. CAs don't provide encryption. They don't sell encryption. They don't make your website secure. That's all done with server and client software. Your browser has the ability to use SSL. It doesn't need a CA. And the web server is set up with software that's purchased or provided by the website administrators. All that a CA does is provide an assertion of identity. Most commercial CAs have historically weakened the security that you get when you're browsing websites because they charge significantly more for higher encryption. You, have, you can have a choice of 40-bit certificates and 128-bit certificates. There's no difference in cost to the CA. They're not doing anything except specifying what strength can be used. All that's handled on the web server and in the browser. So the CA obtains and verifies credentials of the entity applying for a certificate, constructs a certificate with the user provided information, signs it with their root key, and the actual process of encrypting the data exchanged between the web server and the web browser is entirely handled by software that the users and site administrators provide and maintain. If all you desire is encryption of the data you're transmitting to a web server or that your customers are sending to you, the CA isn't necessary. Why are they important then? Web certificates tie all of the necessary elements together. By verifying that a certificate originated at a respected CA and the certificate is still valid,
One is able to tell that the public SSL key, the URL of the website, and the company all belong together. This helps prevent online fraud. For instance, if I were a con artist and I was interested in harvesting credit card numbers of unsuspecting web users, I could set up a quote unquote secure website with a URL similar to, for instance, PayPal. Um, perhaps I could spay it, spell it P-A-Y-P-A-1.com. I could then intercept financial transaction information intended for the legitimate PayPal site. If I sent out, say, spam with the link to my site or somebody mistyped the uh, URL. If the user didn't realize that he typed the wrong URL or followed the bogus link and didn't notice that this was not the actual PayPal site, he would fall victim to my scam. However, due to the use of digital certificates, the user would be alerted to this by warning messages in the browser saying the certificate wasn't generated by a trusted CA or similar error messages. CAs are far from a perfect solution, however. In order to successfully execute any of the attacks that CAs and CA-issued certificates prevent, an attacker relies on a lot of luck and external variables. In order to masquerade as a legitimate site, as in my previous analogy, a con artist has to hope that the user will not notice obvious signs of foul play, such as the URL being wrong. And if the con artist operates for any length of time, he'll probably be caught when his victims become aware they've been fooled and report it. More successful methods of intercepting web form information would be either a man-in-the-middle attack, where communication is passed through an unauthorized computer between the client and server. However, an attacker would have to have a significant knowledge and level of control over a portion of the network that information is passing through for this to be successful. There are easier ways to compromise data. Passive sniffing, a rather easy attack, is prevented because of the SSL encryption being used. You can't set up a, uh, a server to watch network traffic if it's being encrypted between the point of the client and the server. One major security weakness in the current quote unquote secure website system is the source of trusted root certificates for the CAs. These certificates, the root certificates, are certificates that belong to the CAs themselves contain the public key for the CA and are used by your browsers to verify that a server certificate is legitimate. You're presented with a server certificate, it verifies the signature against the public key root certificate and if everything checks out, it passes you on to the secure site without any warnings. You'll notice the little cute lock in your browser turn locked. If a certificate is signed by a root, browser, a root certificate that's not in the browser, you will be notified by a scary pop-up message saying something like, there's a problem with the site security certificate. That's, I believe, Internet Explorer's verbiage. If the certificate is signed by a root certificate residing in your browser, there's no warnings, and therefore the ultimate level of trust lies not with the CA, but with the browsers and the browser manufacturers. In the version of Internet Explorer that ships with Windows ME, there are 107 trusted root certificates in your browser. 107 certificates that can sign public server keys and not present you with any warning messages and assure you basically that those server sites those service certificates are valid and safe to transmit information to. You can look at these yourselves by opening up Internet Explorer, going to the Tools, Internet Options, clicking on the Content tab, from there clicking Certificates, and then clicking the Trusted Root tab. I'll say it again slower if anyone cares, but the point of that was it's not too easy to go in and look at this. Um, they don't make it really obvious to find. It's fairly simple to add certificates to the certificate store, the trusted roots. If someone added a bogus root certificate to the browser's list of trusted roots and was able to get you to use that browser, he could then issue quote unquote valid website certificates as far as the browser is concerned, and you would trust them implicitly. This is basically a simple, easy method of creating a Trojan horse version of IE 
or Netscape without altering the program at all. So you have to be certain that you're obtaining your browsers from a trusted source and they haven't been altered in any way. Or, for instance, if one of those legitimate 107 routes were not protected, the same results could be obtained. What do you know about, for instance, the security of GTE Cyber Trust's certificate? I'm not trying to single out a particular company here, but that root certificate has changed hands. I believe Baltimore owns it now. What assurance do we have that it hasn't been compromised in the transition? Who would be held accountable? What's to say that even certificates that have never left the company that they were originally issued in haven't been compromised? Another major problem with the existing CA structure is the lack of a working certificate re revocation system. As I previously mentioned, one of the benefits of using digital certificates is the ability to verify their auth authenticity offline. However, in order to obtain information to be certain that the certificate is not revoked, one must contact the certificate authority for this information. A certificate would be revoked if it was legitimately issued, but later compromised or suspected of being compromised. It is because of this lack of a good revocation mechanism that short expiration times on certificates are encouraged. Part of the information embedded in the fields in a digital certificate is the validity time. There's a start date and an end date for when the certificate is valid. It shouldn't be used before the start date and it shouldn't be trusted after the end date. This applies to CA routes as well as service certificates. Now it's not a huge deal if a service certificate gets compromised or expires, you reissue a new one. But with root certificates, the issue is much more important because there is a lot of, a lot of trust put in the root certificates and a compromise of a root certificate affects a large number of service certificates. If the compromise was of a leading CA like VeriSign, the results would be devastating. Several years ago, the certificate authority thought lost a good number of customers when its root certificate expired. Expirations are healthy. The longer a key is in existence, the greater the chances that it will be compromised. Unfortunately, Thought's customers saw this as a hindrance to their customers, for it was. And a lot of them moved off to VeriSign. When you try to go to a website that has a legitimate certificate issued by a route that's been expired, scary browser messages pop up again. Users don't like that. VeriSign was quick to capitalize on Thought's mistake. VeriSign, in turn, had the same problem at the end of 1999 when their root certificates expired. The fact that it was at the end of 99, however, led a lot of people to believe it was a Y2K problem, and they were more forgiving, or Verisign as a better marketing spin machine. Remember, the general public expected their refrigerators to stop working as soon as the year 2000 came around, so it wasn't, it wasn't hard to get them to forgive that. Thought's expiration time was perhaps a little too short, but now, if you look at your browser and the root certificates, most of them expire between 2015 and 2020. Thoughts expire in 2020. Some of Vera's signs expire in 2028. Do you plan to be using Internet Explorer 5.5 in the year 2028? These certificates have such a long lifetime that they might as well have no expiration at all. The trust process involving CAs is riddled with potential pitfalls. One assumption we all make is that the CA will actually do its job. It's a reasonable assumption. We expect them to verify that the entity requesting the certificate is actually authorized to make that request. Recently, Microsoft got some bad press when two digital certificates were issued in its name to an imposter. I dislike Microsoft as much as the next guy, but in this case, I had to feel bad for them. The blame here lies with VeriSign, who fell victim to a social engineering attack. They issue hundreds of thousands of certificates. It's bound to have happened. But given the fact that VeriSign can make mistakes, do you really want to rely on it blindly for assurance that sites you're visiting are legitimate? Or is the threat itself so minimal that 
VeriSign or other CAs are nearly irrelevant. Users should be accustomed to examining website certificates before transmitting their sensitive data. If the information they are submitting is sufficiently sensitive, then this inconvenience is warranted. If not, then the CA isn't needed at all. But isn't a CA necessary for SSL? The CAs would like you to believe that. But as I previously stated, the encryption is handled by the software running on the web server and the software that comes built into your browser. So, how does a website admin get an SSL certificate, if not through a CA? Most SSL software allows the generation of self-signed X509 certificates. In this case, all the certificate information is signed by the key of the web server, the key that's actually embedded in the certificate. There is no chain, no root certificate. You are trusting that the certificate presented to you belongs to the website owner. This will set off alarms in the client browser. Unfortunately, many people would rather use no encryption at all and thus receive no warning about invalid site certificates than trust a self-signed certificate. This is foolish. When a browser warns you about an quote-unquote untrusted certificate, it isn't saying that the certificate is one you should not trust. It is asking you if you wish to trust the certificate and it asks you this on a case-by-case -case basis. Users should become accustomed to approving individual self-signed certificates. The dangers of submitting information in the clear without any encryption are rather high, for it takes little effort to set up a password, uh, passive network sniffer if you have access to part of the network that the information is traveling over. Passive attacks are relatively low risk to the attacker and they are generally undetectable. Passive attacks are the main threat to a compromise of privacy while communication is occurring. Though it should be noted that most e-commerce server compromises res that result in loss of uh, customer data, credit card information, etc., are attacks against the databases that store this information, for the payout is much greater. The attacker obtains a large number of credit cards at once from the customer database server, rather than stealing them individually over the wire. Most of the attacks against data that that is being transferred will be attacks against data sent in the clear. They are passive attacks and most will be opportunistic. If encryption is being used, the attackers will not attempt to defeat it. Instead, they'll seek out a different, easier target. SSL is very good at preventing such attacks. It does a poor job of protecting against the remaining small minority of threats. But these attacks are difficult to execute. If the attacker is determined enough to attempt a more sophisticated attack the use of a CA will only provide a speed bump, not a barrier. So, SSL should be used for all user submissions to websites where the information being sent is sensitive, regardless of the origin or issuer of the site certificate, unless the site is clearly bogus. If the website administrator can't afford the CA's fees, he or she should use self-signed certificates. Users should become accustomed to approving certificates on an individual basis and shouldn't allow the browser warning messages to scare them. One of the difficulties with that is that many administrators aren't aware of how to generate self-signed certificates. They like the ease and convenience of the certificate ordering process that commercial CAs provide. And they don't wish to learn how to make their own certificates or they don't have their own time. The FreeCert project is an attempt at a nonprofit certificate authority. Our main goal is to provide certificates to sites whose administrators wish to use SSL, but that desire is not an overwhelming need. They don't have the time or ability to learn how to generate their own certificates and don't have the incentive or the budget to purchase a costly SSL certificate from a commercial vendor. Our main target audience is small businesses, individuals, and nonprofit organizations though anyone is welcome to request a certificate. We should be online within the next month and a half. Initially, FreeCert will be offering website SSL certificates and providing a minimal automated email ping verification of the site administrator. FreeCert routes will be available for download from the freecert.org website. Users can import them into their browsers and have the option to trust them or to review certificates on a case-by-case -case basis. The free cert routes will not be automatically trusted by your browser. This is how 
all browser root certificates should be, however. The user should have to go into the browser and specify which roots he's willing to blindly trust. There shouldn't be any roots in there that are by default trusted. The desired outcome of this project, if it is successful, would be to make web users accustomed to approving or denying individual site certificates. They're going to see these error messages a lot if research use is widespread. They're no longer going to find these warning messages terrifying, and they're not going to stop their browsing because of it. Large majority of users will probably, and already probably do, just click the OK button and go through. But ones that are concerned by this should go in and examine every certificate that they encounter for the first time and choose to trust it or not. We wish to increase the number of SSL secured websites on the internet. FreeCert is not competition for VeriSign. Instead, we're competing against the unsecured web. I spent a little bit of time today criticizing commercial CAs. I'd like to state that most of my complaints are with regard to the use of CAs for web service certificates. Other applications, such as client browser certificates, access controls, attribute certs, and so on, could definitely warrant the use of a trusted certificate authority. Initially, FreeCert will not be doing anything in that area. We don't have the, the ability to do the level of verification necessary. For those of you who are interested, FreeCert is looking for volunteers. If you have experience in project management, website development, shell scripting, feel free to e email me at rabbi at freecert.org for information on how you can help. I could continue talking now about the technology behind FreeCert itself, about the SSL process, or about CA procedures, um, but I don't have time to do all three, so I'd like to turn it over to questions and see what the audience wants to hear. Does anyone have any questions for me? Correct. So key. Well, it's a combination of public key and symmetric key. Right, okay. Um, so when you connect to a uh, secure server, SSL server, uh, you, your browser automatically already has a unique public key that it is transmitting to the server. And now it has the pub your public key to encrypt back to you so that now you can use your private key Right, it's, it works both ways though. When you're submitting to the web server, you're encrypting to the web server's public key. That's... Uh, how, how does that process happen when you install IE5 that, that it has a unique public and private key that it generates for you? Is this a random process? It would be a random key that's generated for your browser. Um, you can also request client certificates. Uh, I don't really want to go into that too much here because that's not in the scope of FreeCert, but the same process that happens for the web server, you can do for your client server and use your client certificate in lieu of a password um, for some sites. Generally, no. There is. Um, Let's say it's strong encryption. Like, like 128 bit, something like that. It's, I'm just wondering why they go through the trouble of a message digest. Right. The information being sent is signed as well. So, if you're submitting the information, you have. Okay. So the scenario here is you have a web server. It's got a legitimate certificate, and you've got your client there. And you do a key exchange, and you set up encrypted to the public keys is a key for symmetric key. Symmetric, symmetric cryptography is 
far faster than public keys. So the actual data that's transmitted is all symmetric key. Um, once they have each other's keys, they set up the shared secret, and then information is encrypted using a stream cipher or a, a symmetric cipher, um, and that information is transmitted between the client and the server. Um, I believe it's binary. It's it possibly could be ASCII, but I'm not not 100% certain on that. But you can't. You're not going to be able to go in unless there's a flaw in the encryption algorithms you're using um, and alter that. Sure. Yes. Um, the question is CRLs. Is it a protocol shortfall in SSL, or is it that most browsers haven't implemented CRL checking? It's pretty much both, um, and it's largely a lack of a comprehensive collection of rogue certificates and a decent mechanism of pushing them out to the browsers. Um, there are some protocols, OCSP, um, that attempt to fix this, but they are not perfect and they are not entirely reliable. FreeCert will have certificate reg revocation lists, but there's the same problems that exist everywhere. We won't be solving any of these certificate revocation issues. If you con you're concerned, you can go and get the certificate revocation list. Most users don't do that. That's the problem. Here. Um, something that I've been trying to do personally is verify fingerprints of, of web server certificates and CA certificates. certificates. And I was wondering if you had any comments on, on user verify. Oh, boy. Um, now I'm going to pick on thought again. So what Russell said here was he's been looking at verifying fingerprints of server certificates and CA root certificates. The fingerprint is a hash of the certificate, basically. And it's a hash is a mathematical calculation that gives you a unique or unforgeable smaller string of numbers that correlates to the data you pass through that, that procedure. Um, the point of a secure hash is that you can't find a desired outcome of numbers by specifying the numbers you're putting, the information you're putting in. Um, it's a one-way function. So these are used to generate fingerprints on keys, which allow you to very easily confirm that you have a valid key. We could conceivably read off all the numbers in the key, but that would take a long time. The way to actually check and make sure that you've got a legitimate certificate, regardless of the CA, is to confirm with the person who actually is authorized to have the certificate what the fingerprint for that certificate is. Now, I don't suppose you can go to eBay and click a button that says, here's our web server certificate uh, fingerprint. Um, and I wouldn't really expect the individual sites to be doing this, but the CAs who are in the business of trust should have a mechanism to verify their root certificates. As I said, a compromise of a root certificate compromises all the certificates issued by that root, not just the one service certificate. A friend of mine called up Thought a few years ago. He made a long distance call to South Africa and he said he wanted to verify the, their fingerprint of their root keys. They didn't know what a fingerprint was. I think that's all I have to say on that. They might call it an MD. I mean, they might call it a he, he explained it. He, they, they call it thumbprint in some browsers. They call it message digest. There's, 
they finally got the idea eventually, and then they said we're not authorized to give that information out. So, um, but you shouldn't have to make a call to the CA. There should be sections of their website that have this information. Now, of course, if their website is compromised, that information isn't uh, trustworthy, but there should be mechanisms for users to verify this. That's something that we'll definitely be doing. And in fact, I've also been thinking about keeping a list of the fingerprints and fingerprints tying to URLs of certificates we issue. So if you wanted to go to our website and verify a fingerprint, you could pull up the list of certificates we've issued. It'll show its whether it's expired or revoked or not, the URL and the certificate. Yes? Would you be able to then spoof that fingerprint as if it were a loop certificate bill an illegitimate site certificate and then that's a URL? No, you can't. You can't the, the reason fingerprints are used is you can't work backwards. You can't take a fingerprint and say, okay, now I want to generate a key that matches up with this. Um, if you can do that, then that's a cryptographic attack against the message digest algorithm. Um, and there's severe problems with not secure hashes. Well, actually, what I was just talking about was the fingerprint of the certificate itself, um, not the actual transmission. Um, you have a certificate. You pass it through the hash. You get the fingerprint. You can't work with a fingerprint and move backwards and get a certificate that matches up with it. The only way to do that is a brute force attack, where you basically generate hundreds and thousands of certificates and look for one that matches. And that will take a long time. Yes? Right, they are not cryptographic problems. Right, I'm not addressing cryptographic problems here at all. It is largely an education issue. Um, and that's what FreeCert really is. It's an education project. We are going to be throwing these untrusted site certificates out there, and it's going to make users question what exactly is happening here. We will have explanations on our website. And hopefully, users will become more educated as they encounter more of these certificates. Sure. I suspect most of the client sites will want to put a small message saying, for information about our, our security, go here and, c and come to our site. But yes, that would be good. You, you trust you trust something yes and you have to it's up to the user to make the, my whole point here is it's up to the user to make that decision it should not be up to a browser which is browsers are distributed from non-trusted sources you don't download a pgp signature with the browser and verify that the browser hasn't been tampered with these decisions are being made for the users without their understanding of what exactly is being decided for them. So yes, you have to place your trust in something, and there is not total security here. Unless you go and talk to the IT administrator of well, but, but given that, what's, what's so bad about I, I dislike Microsoft as much as 
next question. But what's so bad about let's let's just put free start as one of the as the hundred and ten lives on the list of Microsoft. They really don't the user in the end can't make an intelligent decision about this. So you're asking you're asking why I wouldn't go and get free certs roots put into the browser and just become another blindly trusted CA. Um, that's the entire issue I'm trying to fight against here. We don't need another blindly trusted CA. All I'd be doing was providing free certificates out. Um, and we're really not doing enough identity verification to warrant that. The way we're constructing things, we're basically sending out an email ping similar to a lot of um, a lot of mailing this software does to the technical contact of the site and if it comes back valid, we'll issue the certificate. Um, that's the initial first untrusted level. We'll be scaling up as we have more staff. Um, but what we really want to do is make users aware of what's happening here. Even if they can't make the intelligent decision that this is trusted or not, they at least know that there's that risk. A lot of them right now aren't aware that there is a risk that they might be sending stuff to the wrong site. But again, the probability of an attack being executed against a site's certificate and being spoofed is very slim. What really is important is the encryption. The chances that you're going to be encrypting to the wrong website are minimal. So I want to encourage the use of certificates on places where the certificates aren't already being used. Um, let me get one in the back here. There's somebody waving their hand. No? Okay. Um, we have a Chris Ricks. Rex. Rex. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, we're aiming to make people aware of that where are the fact that they're deciding to trust something that is not 100% trustable. You can call me up and confirm fingerprints. But yeah. You, what you do is you, with, with the trust model here, you keep narrowing and narrowing the probability of attack but you never get that probability down to zero. There is no such thing as total security. Yes. And a probability of authenticity, but not an assurance. Yeah, two things. What would you recommend that people do to verify a certificate? So they first have to weigh the value of the information they're submitting. Um, use your American Express card on the internet, you're not responsible for fraud. So if your number is stolen when you're submitting it, there's no out-of-pocket expense for the, uh, the user. In most other credit cards, it's a $50 um, Fifty dollars, you're responsible for the first fifty dollars, and then the rest is eaten by the credit card company. So if they decide that okay, the stuff I'm in, I'm submitting here is super secret, and I need to be sure that the site I'm submitting to is the correct site, what I would do is the, the best way would be to locate the number for the website you're sending. The, the company and talk to someone in their IT department and find out the fingerprint. He's saying that the information he's submitting, it can absolutely not go to the wrong people. Right.
to measure that against how important my data is? Well, that is a decision that has to be made by the user. I mean, I can't tell you what your metric is. I would. But what, what, what can you do to get that? Information? You can call them up. You can you can well, you can examine do an ex examination of the information that's embedded in the certificate and see if it you know sanity check it. If this is a company registered in Russia and it's supposed to be a, a U.S. Um, e-commerce company, that's a red flag. Um, it's all basically whether or not this looks legitimate. And it's, it's very subjective. And the second thing is, would you talk about the software you're using to deploy this? We are using, um, we're using OpenSSL and we have some modifications to it. We have, um, for our key management devices, we're using an Encipher uh, secure key management hardware device. And this is all in Sun um, hardware. In the back there. This is all being done um, by a series of volunteers right now who are donating their time, their bandwidth, and their hardware. We have, um, we're working with the SHMU group and the Crypto Rights Foundation as well. Yes. Yeah, right now it's all, it's all volunteer donations. Um, and the free certificates are the ones that are the low level email ping verification. If we end up having the ability and resources to start doing more in-depth verifications, we will probably be charging a minimal fee and that will go back into funding our resources. Freecert.org. Yes. Um, let me see if there's any other questions about service certificates. I can talk briefly about personal certificates, um, but that doesn't, that's really not what I've been addressing today. But I will talk about that if there's interest. Are there any other? Yes. So you're talking about an internal? For an internal PKI, you don't need a CA at all. You become your own CA. Because I assume you're talking about your, your quote unquote customers are your employees. Right. You don't need an external CA. The external CA is basically for use on the internet at large. If you are setting up an internal PKI, you generate your own route with the software you have, the encryption software. There are some open source um, software solutions out there. They're difficult to set up and configure. And there's some low cost commercial uh, PKI systems and some more expensive PKI systems. You generate your own route and you push that out to the browsers of your employees. And then that's trusted. And you can extend that off. It doesn't have to be just website browsing. You can use that for client certificates. You can use that for access controls for, to your VPN and your IPsec uh, applications, um, et cetera. We're, our website is um, very minimal right now. We're looking for more volunteers. Um, we intend to have a whole education system where we'll provide information and assistance to companies that want to go about setting up something like that. There was somebody in the back there who uh, had a question. Yeah. 
it's in their way of getting something. They didn't say yes, but you get it anyway. True. There are a lot of people that would just say yes, even with any warnings whatsoever. Um, I'm not sure exactly what your question is. That's done by the browser. If it's not a signed certificate from a trusted root, it's going to warn you that it's not a trusted. It's going to be, exactly. It'll pop up us. In what OS? That, uh, to my knowledge, is incorrect. I don't know about XP, but Windows 2000 and ME still warn you if you're not using a trusted, um, if it doesn't originate from a trusted root. Anyone else? You still get a warning if it's not trusted. Right. I think we have time for a few more questions. Anyone? Okay, if anyone wants to uh, see me afterwards to talk about any of this in more detail, they can uh, feel free to find me. Um, or you can email me, rabbi at freecert.org. Yeah. So next up we have Dario Diaz.